Hello, everyone, and welcome to our BC Green Town Hall. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy lives to be here with us tonight. We have a special evening ahead for you. Uh, before we start our evening, I'd like to take a moment to do our territorial acknowledgement, acknowledging that we are all on many different lands and territories tonight. So we respectfully acknowledge the lands and territories of Indigenous peoples that have stewarded that long before there was a British Columbia. As a political party in a colonial political system, we recognize the responsibility the BC Green Party has in transforming this system and for a more truly equitable and inclusive future together. My name is Yonina Campbell. I am the executive director of the BC Green Party, and it great, gives me great uh, pleasure to be your host here tonight. Uh, we have a full agenda this evening, and uh, as Sonia and Adam are here to share what's going on in the legislature and their priorities for our session, uh, the spring session in the legislature. And then later in the agenda, Sonia and Adam are going to uh, do a bit of a Q&A with you and answer your questions. And in a moment, we'll let you know how you can submit your questions for that Q&A. Uh, so just thank you in advance for sharing them. We will do our best to try to get to as many questions as possible. Uh, we have uh, a full house here tonight. Um, we're already up to about 250 people. So, uh, you know, that's going to be lots of questions possibly to get through and uh, only so much time um, to, to do that. So you'll have to come back next time if your question isn't uh, answered tonight. Um, I also just wanted to remind everyone, and you may have seen this in an email this afternoon from me, that uh, the BC Green Party is committed to providing an environment safe of discrimination and harassment so that all individuals are treated with respect and dignity and can contribute fully and have equal speaking rights. And to support this commitment, we do have a, a safe spaces participations guide. And I think that's gonna go in the chat if you didn't see that this afternoon and you wanna have a look at that now. Um, so our goals this evening are pretty simple. Uh, we want to welcome those of you who are new, um, maybe green curious. It's the first time joining us with a, us in an event like this. Uh, we are here to let you learn a little bit about us, um, hear about your priorities, uh, things that are going on in your life. Um, so this is going to be an exciting session also to hear more about what's happening in the legislature firsthand from Sonia and Adam. And uh, it's an opportunity for us to get some feedback from you uh, through some polls and questions. And uh, I, I, I have to say we were, we were joking around a little bit this afternoon. If you've attended one of these sessions before, you'll know that they tend to run with uh, exceptional precision because uh, uh, the staff do a great job of putting together an event that's well uh, planned. Uh, but tonight we are trying out some new things. And I can see that some of you in the chat are already asking a lot of questions about the app that we're gonna be using um, for your ability to submit those questions and participate in those polls. So it's a new thing for us. Uh, so if there's a few glitches uh, on our side or your side or anything like that, that's okay. Uh, it, the whole intention is for us to be able to come together and really feel like we're more together than just you listening to a bunch of people talk. Uh, the idea is to try to, in a way that we connect virtually, to be a little bit more intimate than we normally are. So, um, and then our final goal uh, for this evening is really to let you know about ways that you can get involved with the BC Greens, should that be something that you choose to do. Um, so now I'd like to introduce our fabulous communications director, Stefan Janssen. And Stefan is going to, thank goodness it doesn't have to be me that does this, explain how you're going to use the Mentimeter for our polls to submit your questions. Over to you, Stefan. Oh, you're on mute, <laughs> which is funny um, because I'm doing the tech support. <laughs> so, yeah, someone had to do it. So I just wanted to get it over with right away. Oh, yeah. um, thank you so much, Yonina, and thanks everyone for joining us. Um, my name is Stefan, and I am uh, joining everyone from um, the Lekwungen speaking territory, now known as the Esquimalt and Songhees nations. I'm going to share my screen here, and I'm going to 
show you in a bit more detail how to join Mentimeter. We've, we've sent off some information to you by email. There was um, some information available on the welcome screen when you joined, but um, we know that was just a little bit of information. So want to um, give you a bit more information now to help you through it. So Mentimeter is a tool we're using for to keep, as Yonina said, uh, to keep everyone um, engaged and um, to provide feedback to Sonia and Adam so that they can comment on it um, and also to submit questions. So um, anyone can connect to Mentimeter. You don't need to sign up for an account. Um, you don't need to provide them any information like your email address. It's completely anonymous. And you can join by um, through any device. So um, if you have a smartphone or a tablet and you're comfortable using those, a lot of people will find it um, easy to join on Mentimeter using your phone or your tablet and then uh, watching Zoom on their computer. That way they can have both things open at the same time. That may not be what's comfortable for you, or you may not have a smartphone or a tablet, and that's completely fine. You can also join on your computer. And what you need to do to do that is open your internet browser. So that's Chrome, Firefox, Safari, Edge, any of those internet browsers will be great. There are two ways um, to do this once you've picked your device. The first way is really easiest on a smartphone or a tablet. And if you've used these before, they're called QR codes. I would say that's probably the easiest. If you aren't familiar with QR codes, don't worry about it. You can use method two. So if you're going to use the QR code, code all you need to do is open up the camera app on your phone or your tablet, hold it up to the code, and without pressing the shutter button, you don't need to actually take a picture of it. You just need to hold the, the viewfinder up. It should pop up with a prompt asking you, do you want to load menti.com, M-E-T-N-T-I.com? And you just click yes or click on that prompt and it will load uh, Mentimeter up. And you don't have to do anything else until we're ready to start asking questions. If you would prefer not to use the QR code, um, and um, like I say, I, it's easiest, but um, if you haven't used the QR code before, this, is, this second method is probably the easiest for you. Um, so on your smartphone, your tablet, or your computer, open up your internet browser. Again, that's Chrome, Firefox, Safari, or Edge. And go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I dot com and you'll see right away there's a space for you to enter the passcode and the passcode is right here it's two seven eight five four eight eight nine and then once you've submitted that you'll be in and um what we're going to do i'm just going to talk for a couple of seconds while people do that whenever we share a screen you will see the QR code and the link and code at the bottom of the screen or the top of the screen, one or the other. That's there just in case you um, lose where you were on Menti and you need to rejoin, you can use those anytime. So I'm going to move on from this slide, but if you haven't quite gotten the code or you haven't gotten the link or the QR code, it's just gonna be at the bottom of the screen for the next few slides. When you load menti.com, you're going to find, uh, you're going to be at the welcome screen. And I'll just tell you a little bit about what to find on the welcome screen. So this is of course your smartphone version or your computer tablet version. Um, there are a few things you can do right away. You can show Sonia and Adam some love by liking the town hall. You click the, uh, the heart button. You can click it as many times as you want. Um, there's no limit. And um, that gets recorded for them to see. And I believe you can do that at any point um, throughout the town hall. 
then um, you can also submit questions uh, for Sonia and Adam for the Q&A portion of the town hall, which is in a little while. Um, you can submit questions anytime, even though the Q&A portion is in you know, 40 minutes or so. So to do that, you're gonna click on open Q&A. And then at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little pop-up open up and you can enter your question. Just click on where it says your questions will show up here. Click on that. You can enter your question and then press submit. That's everything for the welcome screen and for um, uh, what will be, uh, you'll be able to access wherever we are in the town hall and whatever question or poll we're on. What we're going to do now is just have a quick practice round. We're gonna ask you a skill testing question and um, you'll see how this works. And of course, if you have any problems at all, click the chat button in your uh, Zoom window and send us a message. It's going to a couple of our staff members who are providing uh, tech support um, to, to whoever needs it. We, not everyone needs to be um, participating. If you don't want to participate in, in um, using Mentimeter, that's completely fine. But um, if you would like to, we'd like to make that um, as accessible as possible for you. So having said that, I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen for one moment here while I switch to our first question. Nope, that's not it. There we go. Okay, so um, I'm going to move us to the next question. And what happens with Mentimeter is whenever I move to the next question, your screen will shift, your screen will change. So you don't actually need to do anything on your smartphone, tablet, or um, computer. So the skill testing question is, what is the name of Sonia's dog? The options are Rufus, Sequoia, Stella, or Powell. And we'll give you a few seconds to enter your, uh, your answer. I'm actually going to show us here where answers are coming in. And you can see they're being adjusted the, uh, by uh, live um, as they go up and down. And just to keep us moving, although you're certainly welcome to guess, it seems like it's a two-way race, clearly between Sequoia and Stella. The correct answer is Stella. Stella is the name of Sonia's dog. So that's how Mentimeter is going to work. Um, when we're ready to move on to the next question, it, it will move for you. So you don't need to worry about clicking next. And if you have any questions, please go ahead and send them in anytime. Thanks so much. Um, thanks again for joining us. And um, I hope you all have a wonderful evening. And over to you, Yonina. Thank you so much, Stefan. I'm just going to wait till we've got that slide off the screen. Thank you. Okay. Just before we begin, um, you know, one of the things that I just want to say in terms of the button around showing the love, I think it's really important to acknowledge um, that while we are busy and we're here to talk a lot about the issues, that there's a, there's a lot going on in Canada and British Columbia and the world. And um, I just want to acknowledge uh, what's happening in Ukraine and the people that that might be impacting here tonight, um, the people across our country and around the world and what that means for democracy and what how important that is to us as Canadians and, and British Columbians. Um, just acknowledge 
all the intersecting crises that people might be impacted by. Um, and, you know, the, the QR code when it came up, it made me think a little bit about how a couple of years ago, I had no idea what that was and how to use it. And something like a, a global pandemic, you know, changed our lives in so many significant, but also so many little tiny ways where suddenly we're using technology to access menus. But it also gives us that opportunity to come here tonight and gather. And I know it's really important to Adam and Sonia because I want to share with you that the genesis of us coming together here tonight was uh, Adam and Sonia asking uh, for an opportunity to be able to connect with people, uh, people that had maybe never connected with our party before, but had been made in contact with them lately because of the things that they had been going through or impacted by. Uh, they wanted to reconnect with people in our party. And so I just really wanted to acknowledge um, that this came from them and, their, and they, that the two of them have nothing but profound care and love for the people that they represent um, across British Columbia, because I really do feel like we have two MLAs in the legislature that really do feel that uh, responsibility to people across the province, not just in their own writings. And I just really wanted from the bottom of my heart to, I, I don't have my app out, but to, to press that love. And I think that you, if you're doing that throughout the evening, I know that will be greatly appreciated uh, because I think that's why we're all here tonight. So without further ado, um, just turning it over to two people that really don't need any introduction at all, but to welcome our BC Greens uh, MLAs, uh, Sonia Firstenau, our party leader and MLA for Couch and Valley, and Adam Olson, MLA for Sandwich North and the Islands. Um, Sonia and Adam have a lot of information here to share with you tonight, and we want to honor your time this evening, and I will help keep the agenda on track by using a little yellow card to warn when there's one minute remaining in each section and a red card when the time is complete. So Sonia and Adam, I turn it over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Yonina. And uh, I'm here on Coast Salish lands on the territories of Cowichan tribes and Malahat Nation. And I'm really grateful to all of you for coming out tonight and joining us. Uh, and also incredibly grateful to the staff. It's a lot of work to put an event like this together and, and they are working hard right through this behind the scenes. And uh, I just wanna uh, give a lot of appreciation for, for what's gone into this. Um, it, it is, a, it is a, 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 honestly a very challenging and distressing time that we're in. And I think for Adam and me and our team in the legislature this week, in particular has felt very heavy. Um, and that's, you know, on after two years of, of what has been the most disruptive period that many of us have gone through in our lives. And I think it's really important to recognize that as these events unfold and this, these situations unfold, it can create a lot of anxiety and angst and anger and distress, um, but that at the same time, we have to remember how important it is to see each other as fellow people and humans. Uh, I think one of the problems that we are trying to address in the legislature, uh, Adam and I, is to remember that we're not enemies across party lines. We are all of us doing our best to be in service. And it's really important to uh, remember that that is what brings people into these public offices and uh, to, uh, to focus on that. That's why I'm getting a very strange sound on my, is that just me? Okay, I'll stop. Anyways, uh, so, so this is where we're at. We wanted to, as you Nina pointed out, uh, connect with people at, at the beginning of this legislative session that we're in right now. The spring session is always uh, the longest and, and most dense session because it's not only bills, uh, but also the budget. So we have kind of simultaneous things happening in the session where bills are being introduced by government, but at the same time, it's the opportunity for the opposition parties to ask questions directly to ministers about the budget. Budget just came out this week, uh, as I'm sure you all are aware. Um, there were some, some good announcements in the budget. We were happy, for example, to see uh, core funding for sexual assault centers in that budget, that they won't have to go back year after year and, and reapply for funding. This is something that 
uh, organizations across the province ask for, and it is really important for providing these core services. Uh, we're also happy to see the funding for a secretariat for the bringing in the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. Uh, this is crucial work uh, for our province and it is essential that the Secretariat, which is a part of, of the Act and, and how it will be implemented is there. Um, but overall, what we recognized in this budget was a lack of recognition of the, the, the way in which the overlapping crises are interconnected and that they, uh, they feed each other in so many ways. We have a climate emergency, we have growing inequality, we have a drug poisoning crisis, we have uh, uh, still coping with a, an ongoing pandemic, we have a healthcare system that has really struggled and is, uh, people are finding it very hard to get primary care. Um, and it is a very challenging time to govern. And uh, we are pointing out that Governance doesn't have to be about um, just one party saying we're going to we're going to do this alone. That we can have mechanisms that exist in our democracy, like committee work, where you build consensus and you have input from public and from experts uh, to get to decisions that are long lasting and and ultimately tend to be uh, the best decisions we can make. So. Um, we're going to get to another question now, and then we're going to jump into some of the more core issues and get to the question and answers. But uh, our next question, and then I'll hand it over to Adam while we wait for the results uh, to do a little bit of introduction. Um, our next question is, where are you coming? Uh, where are you tonight? Um, where are you joining us from? And so the poll is going to go up and you're going to have an opportunity to put in your information. It'd just be great to see where, where everybody's joining us from tonight. And while people are answering that, Adam, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, good evening. And uh, all right, good evening. And uh, thank you for uh, the introduction, uh, Sonia. And thank you for this opportunity to our um, to our team uh, for putting together this uh, this event. I would just, if I was to add anything, uh, Sonia, to uh, your opening comments, I would just um, include uh, the heaviness that our constituency teams uh, our feeling as well. I know you you acknowledge the the work that's being done uh, in our legislative office uh, in the uh, caucus BC Green Caucus office, um, but you know I've had the uh, benefit of, of sitting um, uh, across the the tables uh, in committees with my with our colleagues uh, from all parties and just acknowledging the heaviness that our constituency uh, assistants are feeling and and in terms of um, uh, just over the, over the past uh, number of weeks, it's been it's been challenging uh, throughout COVID for sure to be able to deliver uh, services to uh, um, to people from uh, you know using uh, video conferencing services and things like that. We've done our best to adapt. Uh, it's gotten um, it's gotten quite challenging over the last number of weeks. So I just want to raise my hands to all of the constituency assistants that are uh, that are supporting the MLAs. Uh, in their work and and um, and I think yeah just uh, just wanting to raise my hands to them as well. I should say I'm very happy to be working tonight uh, this evening uh, in this uh, from my home here in uh, Hoxaitnich in the Chocolate Village uh, in uh, in the Hoxaitnich territory uh, on the Sandwich Peninsula and uh, look forward to uh, to navigating this evening and and um, answering as many questions as we can. All right, so it's uh, it's great to see the results, and it's uh, a, a wide range of communities uh, on the screen here, and it's wonderful to see people from across BC, the Lower Mainland. I see Richmond, Salt Spring, Abbotsford, Saanichton, that's where my mom lives, uh, Cobble Hill, very close by here, Port Alberni, Squamish Territory. It's, uh, I, it's, it's great to see people from really all over BC joining us this evening and, and a warm welcome to everybody. So our first topic that we're gonna talk about before we get to the Q&A is, is healthcare. This is something that we've been raising in the house uh, in this session and we will continue to do so. so. And one of the concerns we had uh, 
and this is back to 2017 when, when Adam and I were both elected, is the number of people in our ridings and our constituents uh, and around BC who do not have access to a family doctor, to a, a general physician, to longitudinal care, which we know is so crucial to uh, really be the best outcomes, health outcomes that we can hope for. It, it is so important to have a family doctor. I personally, um, my doctor retired about a year and a half ago. And I, after 25 years with the same doctor, I found it to be a, a, a deeply upsetting um, bit of news to learn that I was no longer um, going to be with this doctor that I'd really grown to uh, trust and love. And um, he had seen me through my three babies and many other parts of my life. So um, our, as we're going through this, and I'll, I'll, I'll pass it to Adam to talk a little bit more about this, but the, another poll will go up about whether or not you have a family doctor. And as we're doing that, Adam, if you want to talk a little bit about this from your perspective as well, I know you've been very engaged on this. Yeah, so uh, last week I asked uh, two questions uh, about this, uh, about the situation, family doctors. It was, it's been um, uh, an issue that uh, I and my constituency team have been uh, really uh, deeply engaged with. And on the Saanich Peninsula, just as an example, there are in the range of about 15,000 unattached uh, people to a, a family doctor or a team of, 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 of healthcare practitioners in the primary, primary care um, practitioners. Uh, and we know that the provincial government's been trying to create uh, primary care networks, which is the team-based care. Uh, that uh, effort was um, sort of sidelined and, and replaced with the the uh, urgent and primary care centers, uh, yet another acronym. Um, and those are essentially, uh, rather than um, longitudinal care, those are more urgent care. So uh, think large walk-in clinics uh, that I think provides a level of primary care, but again, it's episodic. And, and these are important words that we're using, longitudinal and episodic, uh, because what we're seeing in the healthcare uh, delivery in our provinces is uh, moving away from equitable universal health care that provides a longitudinal service, a lifetime service, uh, and more going towards uh, episodic services. So uh, think walk-in clinics and emergency rooms. Uh, very troubling. We're starting to see the, corp the, the increase of, of uh, large corporations uh, like they see down in the United States. Uh, we, we see the, uh, the impact of, of uh, that. Um, in my riding, there's uh, one clinic that's charging a $50 membership fee. We're, we're starting to see and, and hear uh, that there are now uh, a, a universal primary care, which is uh, a very basic level. And then there's uh, clinics offering primaries, or sorry, premium services. And never before had we heard about a, a premium uh, primary care service, meaning screenings and anything over and above a basic visit uh, to to sort out what might be ailing you at that moment. Um, the the equitable universal healthcare system that we've come to be very proud of in our in our province um, uh, is starting to evolve. And uh, the questions that I asked last week, and I think the questions that we're going to continue to ask, is um, is it exactly where does Minister Dix and, and this BC NDP government see primary care going? Is it going to be something that's delivered uh, by large corporations that have the capital to be able to hire the doctors and, and put them on salary uh, and, then, uh, and then really deliver a tiered uh, um, primary care service? Uh, or is it going to be the, the service that I think British Columbians and Canadians have become very proud of? And I can see from the, the poll results here that um, it matches about what we see in the data around access to a uh, family doctor. Um, for tonight, of the people that have responded, 30% are saying that they do not have a family doctor, 66% yes, 5% uh, unsure. Um, and that matches what uh, about one in four British Columbians right now uh, do not have uh, or living in the CRD do not have access to a family doctor. 
Um, and as Adam points out, uh, the, the real worry here is uh, moving away from a truly equitable and truly universal uh, healthcare system. And, and importantly, that this is unfolding without there being a direct conversation about this with the people of British Columbia. And, and that to me is, is quite a concern that um, this, is, this is a surprise to a lot of people, including us, uh, and this is why we will continue to ask about this in the in the legislature and in estimates, um, because it's it's something that I think we want to ensure does not happen in British Columbia, which is you can access healthcare if you can afford it, as opposed to being able to access healthcare as part of um, what it is to be a citizen of this province. I think one, one final thing I just add to that, uh, Sonia, is, it, is it's an equity issue, but it's also a healthcare system uh, issue as well, yeah. in, in the sense that uh, if you are not doing the, the screenings, uh, you know, I think the messaging to British Columbians and Canadians have been, you know, especially around cancer, you know, get screened. Uh, that's the, the best time to find that you have uh, something ailing you is, is uh, as soon as you possibly can. And so if British Columbians are not getting access to screenings, if they're not getting access to the preventative uh, aspects of healthcare, uh, then we will find that our healthcare system is overburdened with people that are sick when it's um, much more advanced than I think we would like it to be. So it becomes a, a, I very much want to put emphasis on the equitable aspect of it, but also there needs to be emphasis on the impact of the system overall. Yeah. And a recognition that uh, the providers, the healthcare providers, doctors, nurses, um, also need to be uh, in a system that does not undermine their health and well-being. And we have had a lot of conversations in the last weeks and months about uh, the challenges of uh, for healthcare workers in in the healthcare system right now. Um, and that that's another aspect of this that is really important. We will probably get more questions about this in the Q and A. Uh, I expect, as it is something that I know matters to a lot of people. Uh, another thing that matters, of course, and another crisis we face in British Columbia is the, the lack of affordable housing. Um, again, in our constituency offices, I know that this is uh, a significant and often the most uh, common issue that people are coming into our offices to seek help for, to, uh, to raise with our staff, which is the inability to find uh, affordable housing. And that's become worse and worse year over year. We saw the, uh, the enormous jumps in some of the housing assessments over from last year to this year and the implications for that for uh, affordability to not just uh, people purchasing, but for renters as well. Um, this is a problem that has been yeah, underway in British Columbia for a long time. And, uh, you know, the, the real, the, the fundamental thing is when people don't have that, that basic access again to, to housing, uh, it's, it's basically impossible to find yourself in a place where you can thrive. Um, so this is a, another issue that we have been focusing on and we did a lot of questions on it and uh, working on proposing solutions uh, when we were in the fall session. And uh, we're going to go to another po uh, poll. Well, I turn this again. We're going to see the pattern now uh, to Adam. But the question that we're going to ask for this next poll is what word would you use to describe your experience with the housing crisis? Uh, and Adam, maybe you can talk a little bit more about uh, some of the things that we've proposed and, and see as solutions on this front? Well, I think, first of all, uh, I think that uh, it's incredibly important uh, that we acknowledge Stella wanted to talk uh, to, uh, there she is, excellent, all oh, kisses. Um, when it comes to, uh, to housing, there, there are uh, some very troubling aspects of this that uh, the provincial government uh, is in a, there's an inherent uh, conflict in that if you take a look at this year's budget, we see a, almost a doubling uh, of their expected revenues uh, for the property transfer tax. So on one hand, we have a government that's talking about affordability and talking about creating 
uh, for affordable housing units. And on the other hand, they are uh, banking, literally banking uh, for our for revenue source, uh, billions, 3.2 billion, I think this year it was on the property transfer tax. That's over uh, 1.2 billion two years ago. So we have seen a remarkable increase. And not only that, but when we ask these questions, uh, Sonia, you asked this question on Tuesday, I believe I've asked these questions in, in previous sessions. And what we have uh, from the minister is uh, a complete, it doesn't even acknowledge, won't even mention uh, property transfer tax. Uh, instead, we'll, we'll take a, a walk you know, around the issue. And, uh, and I think that that's uh, incredibly uh, problematic. Second piece of this that I think needs to be highlighted is, is in and around uh, the $2 billion that uh, came forward in the budget last year for the housing hub, which is uh, for middle income, basically middle income uh, housing solutions. These are a mix of, of affordable units and market units. But what we see is, is provincial money, yeah, taxpayer money being put into uh, and invested in um, uh, the, the market. Uh, side of, of housing. And I think that what we've been talking about is uh, acknowledging that housing is a, is a human right. And then second of that, any money that the provincial government puts into this real estate market needs to go to strictly non-market solutions. Uh, because the last thing that we need is the provincial government benefiting from the revenue generated from the property tax and then taking that tax money and investing it into market housing, which will in the end uh, that money will be then leveraged and uh, and the potential for profits to be taken on it are, are there. So I think that we're, I think that it's it is a really uh, problematic aspect of the housing hub. I think the housing hub is a very, very unique and and good program um, where you are taking uh, a certain amount of, of public money and you are financing the types of housing uh, tenures that, you want to see, and in, in, in this, I mean, uh, affordable housing units, uh, homes for British Columbians to be built. However, if if it's just going into uh, the housing market as it is right now, all we're doing is just driving up uh, the cost of real estate. So um, th those are two areas that I think, uh, one on the supply side, and then the other on the, on the demand side that uh, this provincial government needs to, uh, needs to talk about. The, the third aspect of this, and I'll just end with this, and that is that we've heard a lot of talk about zoning and a lot of talk about local government, uh, in, you know, um, inability to approve enough supply. And what I would say is that um, it is, we've seen jurisdictions around uh, talking about removing the single family zone and, and, and giving more flexibility to multifamily developments. I think that there needs to be, uh, while I'm generally supportive, I think there needs to be more of a community conversation about this than a provincial government just foisting it on. I think we do need to have uh, some movement forward on this, but it needs to. We need to also bring people along uh, with us, and I think that uh, it's up to the Minister of Housing to bring British Columbians along uh, with with this uh, initiative because it's a dramatic change in communities that likely needs to be done, but it needs to be done carefully and thoughtfully and compassionately uh, to British Columbians as well. It's, it's interesting to look at these uh, results um, and the words that have come up, lucky, frustrating, unfair, privileged, fortunate, greed, scary, stressful, frustration, precarious. Uh, I think precarious is, is such an important word because we know that uh, the, the feeling of precarity is one that really undermines our, our sense of well-being and, and mental health. Um, so it's, again, it's the, 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 the deep reality of how, how, how many people are affected by this uh, and how much worse it has gotten um, in the last uh, number of years. Uh, despite the efforts, and I, I, I will say, you know, the, the, this government has been making efforts uh, in, uh, since it came in, um, but that the efforts have not met the severity of the crisis and, and that we have to re recognize that we aren't in a situation where um, small measures are going to be sufficient to address 
this kind of uh, depth of a crisis that we're seeing. Um, we're gonna move finally to one more area of discussion and then to the Q and A. Um, of course, last year we saw some of the most significant weather related events that this province has ever seen. I think that it felt uh, almost like a never ending cycle of, um, of severe weather. And, and I remember a, a, a news story that came out at the end of the year, Czech News um, reported on how many severe weather stories they reported on in 2021. And it was several every month. Um, but I know that, uh, you know, when we think about the, the, the heat dome at the beginning of summer, the wildfire seasons, the drought and the drought level here in Cowichan was the highest it's ever been. Uh, we were at a stage five drought. Uh, and then within really a matter of weeks of that drought period, um, seeing the atmospheric rivers and the flooding, the damage to infrastructure that happened, uh, these more severe and more frequent uh, weather events are what we have been told by experts for decades uh, is what climate change is delivering. And it is incumbent on all governments and all societies to recognize uh, not only do we have to look at of course, we do not give up on reducing emissions and addressing the, the challenge of climate change, but recognizing that uh, we are at a point where these kinds of events are going to become more and more frequent. Um, the, the, the response that we saw last year uh, over and over again really did feel like a reactive response that these events would happen um, and instead of uh, being out in front of them, we were seeing a very reactive, uh, almost after the fact kind of response to them. And I think that this, these lessons are important for, for the government to learn. And, and we saw in the budget, for example, more investment into monitoring uh, the River Forecast Center, uh, climate monitoring stations. This is a good step. This is a recognition that we need to be more proactive. The year-round fun funding for uh, wildfire protection uh, and response also is a recognition that uh, the efforts uh, to contain and curtail wildfires have to be year round. Um, and so as we go through this last bit of discussion before the Q&A, the poll question that we're gonna put to you again, uh, to get a gauge on, on where you're at is how concerned are you about the personal impacts of the climate change events that, uh, that we've seen. And there's wildfires, floods, extreme temperatures, or other. Um, I would say that, uh, again, we are looking at such a significant systemic uh, effects from climate change and, and you know, other could include, for example, uh, the loss of biodiversity and the implications of that for uh, ecological health, but also for human health. Um, you know, we have uh, enormous devastation and loss that we're seeing globally um, as a result of climate change. Um, Adam, over to you. Yeah, I, I think that it's, it's important to acknowledge that, uh, that many people in, in uh, Victoria, in uh, British Columbia have been and have felt those impacts directly. And if you are joining us this evening and you have uh, experienced this, I, we hope that we can have this conversation in, um, in a compassionate way because we recognize that a lot of people have been displaced. Uh, and it, it really means, it really is a situation that I think in which our government has to become, uh, and you, you're talking about being reactive, a compassionate government acts proactively. And um, you know, this is not just uh, uh, this is not just about uh, mitigating the the impacts of these extreme weather events when they happen. It's about adapting uh, to the situation that we're facing so that we can uh, be, increase our resilience, increase our support for people. The reality is that we knew that the heat wave was coming for days, and the the response and the the the, the lack of response in many cases. Is not an is not acceptable. We wonder why it is that people are losing confidence when a government says 
in in a government that says, look, we we've, we've got your back. We're looking out for you. And then when British Columbians need them the most, uh, there there there's no one on the other end of the line. Uh, and and what that's done is it's you know it's put increased huge amount of pressure on our constituency offices and on services that actually are not built to to be responsive uh, in this way. So uh, we need to be uh, investing in and increasing resilience. Uh, that includes uh, the social infrastructure and in supporting people, but it also is the uh, the physical infrastructure of our roads and highways. We saw just the. Uh, and, and you can imagine the, the reason why the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure had uh, basically free reign to spend as much uh, as quickly as needed in order to rebuild those those uh, roads and, and rail lines, because the, the, the economic and social environmental impact of them not being um, of, of us not being able to access the rest of the province is a is a huge threat. and. and and then to the supply chains. And, you know, we look at our ability to feed ourselves on Vancouver Island. It's a day or two before we run out of food because we've not thought to invest in that local resilience. But it goes further than food. There are so many products. And you, just looking around the ancient building of the, uh, of the legislature, there are products that were built uh, and, and manufactured in Victoria that there's no possible way that we, that is, those products are being manufactured there now. And so we've lost a, a huge amount of our local economy, which is which was uh, local manufacturing and, and reduced supply chains. And so uh, when the provincial government talks in the budget about supply chains, it's not about imports and exports necessarily. It's about supporting those um, those local manufacturers that, that make products and making sure that we have uh, as part of our uh, as, as part of our economy, uh, robust manufacturing, uh, small scale manufacturing, but manufacturing uh, of, of the products that we need. So looking at the results for the poll, I mean, the, the level of, of personal impact uh, is pretty significant uh, from these polling results here, 8.8 .8 on wildfires, 7.9 floods, 8.7 extreme temperatures uh, and seven on others. That, that, that is a, a pretty significant high uh, level of personal impacts from these, these events. And of course, uh, for most of us, these events did impact us uh, last year. And I think it really hits home how um, these weather events are, are having such a profound effect on, on ourselves and our communities and the, the need, as Adam points out, for really leaning into how do we become a more resilient province? Uh, how do our communities become more resilient? I've uh, I'm, probably some of you have seen me share it before, but uh, after the first year or second year of, of significant wildfires that we had in BC, and, and we were actually on a road trip with a family driving to various communities, which is what we did before the pandemic um, in the summertime. So I could get to as many communities as possible. At one point we were turned back and, and literally had to flee uh, a wildfire that was heading our way and ended up having to go all the way to the Eastern edge of the province uh, to come home to Vancouver Island uh, because the wildfires were so so significant that year, um, but I made a chart about neighborhood captains um, and and how do we take resilience right down to a level of our neighbors and mm. how we can put in systems now so that we are there for each other uh, whenever these kinds of disasters strike, but also develop a kind of uh, asset inventory of of tools and skills that we have available in our neighborhoods and build our resilience right up from right where we live, uh, up through our communities, through our districts, our, our wider regional districts and across the province. And I think that it, it is essential that we recognize that the, our resiliency just isn't about built infrastructure. Uh, it's not just about natural infrastructure, which is absolutely essential to our resiliency. Um, and, and I think the, the conversations around our land use practices and the way that they have exacerbated these weather events is a really important conversation. 
but our resiliency is very much our social infrastructure, our social fabric, and how important that is that, uh, and we see it in the, in the disasters, uh, the, the heroic efforts and kindness and care that people showed for each other um, throughout these many disasters. Let's build that into how we live uh, because this is going to be uh, an ongoing challenge for us as we navigate the, the years and decades ahead. So I this, may, oh, so go, go ahead. I may just add one thing. I really appreciate it. I see the, the comments uh, on the, of the chat here, and I really appreciate it. And uh, something that uh, Karen has mentioned and, and you just mentioned, I remember a conversation that I had with uh, the former uh, Kukpi, uh, uh, former chief uh, of uh, Skichison, uh, Ron Ignace, Kukpi Ignace. And um, when, when we visited there uh, pre-pandemic, and he was very, very clear that he was taking a, uh, a, a program idea to the federal government around natural infrastructure and how our forests, uh, and, and when it comes to forest fires and wildfires, how the types of forests, we, we really need to extend our thoughts, and our, our ideas outside the box of, of how we view infrastructure to view the natural infrastructure. So I'm very glad that it was raised by Karen and, and it was raised by uh, you, Sonia, just a few minutes ago. I just want to acknowledge that uh, that uh, the conversation that we had with Kukpi Ignace uh, really, I think, um, uh, captures what we hear from a lot of Indigenous leaders when we meet with them around uh, the relationship to nature and, and how nature functioning well looks after all of us. So um, we're going to move to the question and answer period. And you know, Nina, I think you're coming. There you are coming back on uh, to join us here and help to um, navigate through this, uh, the question and answers here. All right. Um, so thank you, Sonia and Adam, so much for sharing your priorities and uh, to what's happening in the legend in BC. Um, and thank you to all of you who submitted questions. We have those. And my understanding is that they're going to come on the screen and Sonia and Adam will be able to read the question and respond. And I think what we're gonna to try to do is stick to about four minutes per question. Um, so Sonia, over to you. <laughs> okay, well, the first question, do you think housing, the housing crisis in BC is reaching a tipping point? How can we lower the cost of housing without bursting the bubble? And I, 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 I think it was, uh, one of the comments I saw the other day about housing is everybody wants the, the housing crisis to be solved, but not for it to affect the value of their own house. And, and this is one of the real challenges we have, which is that um, on the one hand, uh, for those of us fortunate enough to be homeowners, of course, um, there is a, uh, a tension between the value of, of the house and the, the tools needed to ensure that uh, the housing crisis does not uh, in fact reach this point at which it is causing the kind of harm that we're seeing. Lowering the cost of housing without bursting the bubble. And, and I think that this is, a, this is a very important question. And I'm, I'm gonna use two minutes and then pass it to Adam as well, because I know that he has some real insights into this, but the, the non-market, uh, the non not for profit housing sector, the the ability to create housing that does not contribute to um, the, the the forces that are driving the the market based housing up is essential because uh, at this point far too many people are simply priced out of the housing market. Uh, Thirty six years is not a reasonable time to have to save up to put a down payment on a house. Um, and so I think that one of the very important pieces of this is, is to really recognize how important, uh, I just said important twice, it is late on a Thursday, uh, the non-market piece. And, and again, on a personal level, uh, when I was a child and my mother was a single mother, we lived in rent controlled housing owned by the city of Edmonton. Uh, it was, the rent was a portion of her salary uh, she worked at a bank, had three kids, and that was uh, what allowed my mom to get on her feet after a divorce and to be able to uh, start saving up to buy a piece of land, which she eventually did. 
But that is an example of a mechanism that uh, we need more of. Adam? The, the, only, the only things that I'll, uh, that I'll add to that, because I think it was a good answer, is, is that we have uh, a lot of people that are underhoused, and we have a lot of people that are overhoused. We have a lot of empty rooms, bedrooms. We have a, a, um, a philosophy about what housing needs to be in this, in this country that was formed largely after the Second World War, when home ownership was, and, 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 and the construction of new homes was uh, the major economic driver uh, of, of, the, uh, of the country following uh, the devastation of a, of a world war. Uh, so there's those aspects of it that, that need to be addressed uh, because um, what, we're, what we're actually talking about is how do you provide homes for people in an economic system that doesn't reward the kind, that, that, that doesn't allow for that to happen. <laughs> because the rewards of, of capitalism reward other things. And so I think what we need to do, uh, as you've pointed out, and the only emphasis that I'll put, we need to build non-market solutions to providing homes. And also we will have a housing market uh, that continues to exist, but uh, the government investments need to be in non-market solutions. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're, you're muted, Irina. Sorry, you just need to ask for next question and they'll put the, the next vote. question, please. It's been suggested by the Green Party that an all party committee needs to be urgently convened to address the toxic drug poisoning. Can you talk a bit about what that could possibly look like? Uh, this is a very timely question um, because just today uh, in the chamber, um, the the motion to populate the committees, which includes the health committee, uh, which is uh, one avenue for an all party committee to look at the toxic drug poisoning crisis. Um, th that motion was brought forward. And typically in the, in the legislature, a motion like that comes forward uh, often by leave, which just means it doesn't even go through the, the kind of standard procedure of being on the order papers. Um, it didn't go by leave this time because we said no. Uh, and that motion typically just passes. Everyone goes, yay, and, and we move on. But today, uh, I stood up and spoke to that motion. Uh, the leader, uh, the internal leader of the BC Liberals, Shirley Bond, stood up, and Adam stood up, and all three of us um, made the case for this need for all-party approach to the dr toxic drug poisoning crisis. Seven people every day are dying from a poisonous supply of drugs right now. Uh, and I think it's very important, the coroner's report and, and her comments when that came out um, for the last two months of 2021, she said, do not let the image of, of somebody who is unhoused or um, you know, in real crisis be the image in your head of the people who are dying. People are dying, the vast majority of people are dying in their homes. Um, people are dying who are not addicted to drugs. I think that this is very important. Uh, people are not, uh, people are dying because the, the supply of drugs is so toxic. Uh, first time users are dying. Young people are dying. Uh, people who have used drugs throughout their life uh, and have navigated that, uh, you know, some of us might go have a glass of wine. Uh, that is using a drug, um, uh, are dying. And I think that what we have to recognize is that the drug policies that exist right now, just as prohibition was a policy, uh, was a deadly policy. And we have deadly drug policies right now. And we can't accept that, uh, that we can just let seven people die every single day in this province. Um, we met with Mum Stop the Harm uh, when they were out in front of the legislature, I think it was a week and a half ago, Adam. Um, people holding photos of, of the loved ones that they've lost. Um, these, are, these are holes in our lives that are left behind and they don't have to be. Um, and the, again, this is a crisis that uh, all, all manner of reasons, stigma, um, not wanting to, to be uh, the government that is making bold policy changes. 
uh, it, uh, all of these decisions are being made and it's resulting in a huge amount of unnecessary death. The reason we're calling for the committee, and I've said this many times, is that the consensus that you can build across party lines gives government permission to move more quickly and more urgently. And that's what we need to see. And when we hear from this government, oh no, we have safe supply. Uh, it, it, it's literally uh, a couple thousand people in this province who have access to a form of prescribed safe supply. Um, there are over a hundred thousand people who use drugs in this province. And uh, we have to recognize that uh, people shouldn't be having to risk their lives uh, when accessing the drug supply. The only thing I'd add to this is we can ill afford policy lurch. So one of the things and what you were talking about, Sonia, about building consensus around an action on this, if you have all parties sitting at the table, you are less likely to see a reversal of policy when this government gets unelected, which at some point every government gets unelected. And, and so what we need and, and what the committees offer is a place, a safe place for consensus to be built so that there's less likelihood for policy lurch, meaning when another uh, government gets elected, this policy is out and a new policy is in, which which is we can ill afford. I'm going to add one last thing, and then we'll go. Uh, we'll go. But in my research around committees and and um, the case that we're making for committees, there's there's a the, the committees are meant to be one of the tools of the legislature, as in any Westminster parliamentary system, in any um, parliamentary democracy, committees are a tool for elected members to hold government to account, to be able to call government in, ask them questions, uh, to do as Adam's doing right now on the Police Reform Act Committee, to present after hearing from a wide variety of experts, of people with lived experience, of um, people with policy ideas, people who understand these files very deeply, for that committee to then make recommendations to the government and say, this is your path forward. Here's how it does, here's how you can do it. There was a lot of this work happening under the minority. Um, even the, the Police Act Reform Committee was struck under the minority. I know Leonin is giving me a, a, a sign here. The 2017 report from the Health Committee, um, which had operated for over two years under the previous government, 59 recommendations, the, the 59th recommendation was for safe supply. We had consensus. Uh, and this, this makes me so upset. Um, but then the election happened and everything starts again. And we have to get past that, as Adam says, that policy lurch that happens in these majoritarian governments and get to a place where the continuity of the work of the legislature is there regardless of what party is in government. Okay, next question, here we go. Adam, how about, do you wanna read this question? Sure. How can we get more primary care physicians in BC? Um, so I think uh, we can do more to train uh, more primary care physicians so we can open up more spaces in our, in our hospitals. Uh, I think we can um, have a, a better system for acknowledging the qualifications of uh, physicians from other jurisdictions, uh, that, from other uh, parts of, of the world that come here, uh, whether it be um, finding ways to, uh, to just acknowledge their, quali their qualifications or uh, to expedite their uh, qualifications to be you know, brought up to the Canadian standards. Uh, I think both of those are useful. Uh, and I think that as well, we can recognize that maybe we don't just need physicians. What we need are physicians working with a team of, of healthcare practitioners. We're, we're actually having this conversation about Police Act as well. You know, uh, we, 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 may, we don't need necessarily more police. We need more, we need police and we also need uh, more mental health practitioners as an example. So in the, in the primary care uh, setting, that looks like more nurses, more uh, registered nurses, more LPNs, uh, more nurse practitioners, and more and and as well uh, family doctors. And so 
Uh, I think what's really important is to recognize that each of those professions do specific work. And, and the way that our uh, remuneration of, uh, of physicians right now through the uh, fee-for-service model works, it really uh, works to restrict or reduce uh, the desire of or the ability for doctors necessarily to work with other professions who are maybe working uh, on salary. Uh, because it, it because the way doctors get paid, I'm not sure if people understand this, is that when they meet with you, they get paid, I think it's $35 uh, per visit. And so that's $35 for a complex uh, cancer patient, as an example, uh, as it is uh, for an immunization or um, for you know a very quick call to do a prescription renewal. It's the same. And so uh, it doesn't make any sense for, for uh it makes it more difficult for family doctors, I would say, to be working in a team-based environment where uh, an immunization, which could be done by a registered nurse, as an example, uh, that's a visit. That's a doctor's visit. And doctors need those visits in order to be remunerated in a way that, that, uh, that then they can afford to live. So I think what needs to happen is we need to change the funding model. I think the, doc I think the, the province acknowledges this. They should actually get on with it. Uh, and then uh, we should find a way so that uh, doctor, family doctors or physicians are doing what physicians do, registered nurses are doing what registered nurses do, and LPNs are doing what they do, and, and they're working as a team together to develop services for their, uh, for their patients or their clients. Okay, uh, I think Adam hit yeah. out of the park there, so we'll go to the next question. I think we're going to try and fit in two more, Sonia. If that, uh, if we can keep it to mm -hmm. about four minutes, that would that would work out great. Mm. So the next question is, what was missing from the government's budget as far as protecting old growth and protecting our environment? Uh, now, um, everything. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. I I think one of the things that we've made really clear. Uh, since raising the issue around protecting old growth and is the need for conservation financing, particularly for First Nations, that it can't be, uh, here's your choice. You can um, either uh, log this old growth as your economic uh, activity or nothing. Um, and that, that is not a choice. That should be uh, the only choice that, that any community has. I think we have to recognize the um, th just how stark this has been and that until governments put the, uh, the, the funds on the table for conservation financing and importantly for indigenous led uh, restoration and conservation, I, I, we have a lot of healing of the lands to do, not just uh, to stop the, uh, the destruction of old growth and what little is left, but to restore the land base to something that is far more uh, able to, to thrive and protect us. We know that monoculture uh, forestry uh, results in, I think Bob Simpson put it so well, I'll never get, forget this, it, it becomes food for pests and fuel for fires. And uh, that, that is playing out very much in what we see. Um, we also know that, um, and I'll just end on this. I, I cannot believe that in 2021, and I, I was 21 uh, when I was uh, building boardwalks in Carmana and, um, and the Walbrun to, in the efforts to protect those old growth forests, I cannot believe that we are still uh, clear cutting in this day and age. It, it is astonishing to me. And so forest practices an absolutely need to change. But in terms of was, what was missing, The, the vision for where we are getting to, and then the, the, the measuring of how, how successfully we're getting there. The, we have the old growth review panel report. Uh, it laid out a plan. What was missing was the, the real commitment to that plan being executed. Um, okay, Adam, if, unless you feel an urgent need to add anything to that. Okay, next question. Would love to hear more about access to psychological services, mental health services. 
Uh, in June 2020, we were working with the BC Psychologists Association um, to put a proposal in front of the government, this was back when it was still a minority, um, to incorporate psychologists into, uh, into healthcare so that people could access psychologists as part of their mental health care, as part of their primary health care, recognizing that, of course, our, our mental health is our health. And I think we have learned even more about that in the last two years uh, than we could have imagined. Last year, we brought a private member's bill forward to, um, to bring regulation to counseling and therapy in British Columbia. We're an outlier in the country around having regulation. Uh, we need to know that people have the, the, the training and the education and the credentials um, to be delivering mental health care. And then uh, we need counselors and psychologists and therapists to be incorporated into our healthcare system. Uh, I said this the other day in the house, the, the, the first point of contact for mental health care should not be the emergency psychiatric ward. Um, but for far too many people, it is. And uh, when we have uh, youth unable to access mental health care in their communities, students not being able to access counseling, I, as a teacher, even, you know, I don't know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, it was astonishing to me that we got the counselor available to us uh, in our school for maybe one day a week. And that was for a school of over 400 students, uh, a middle school. And there was no way that uh, the, the kids that needed access to, to the, that counselor were going to get what they needed. This is again, something that has been uh, left far too long to grow into a, a crisis. And it is a, a very significant crisis. Um, and we need to see more than um, just words and uh, plans. I think we need to see measurable outcomes and accountability for, for people actually getting access to, health, to mental health care uh, and psychologists when they need it. And we know from the data, the, psych, the BC Psychologists Association is so great at this, at, at the data around the benefits um, to, uh, to psychologists in terms of overall health um, is significant. And so it's an investment into, a healthcare, into the healthcare system that actually uh, takes a burden off of the healthcare system. And, and that's the kind of investment that we would need to see. Um, time for one more question. Okay, one more question. There we go. We're, Adam and I got a good talking to about um, keeping our answers not too long because we are, have a tendency to go deep and long. So next question. Next question. How can we support renters? Adam was on the renters task force. Over to you, Adam. Um, well, this is uh, th this. I think what is it? Uh, One point five million British Columbians rent, and so there there are. This is a, a big issue for many many uh, British Columbians. I think uh, I think it needs to go uh, further and deeper than um, than just uh, the the four hundred dollar renter rebate as an example that was uh, proposed. I think two elections in a row now by uh, the BC NDP. They've they've yet to follow through with it. Um, it was a bad idea in 2017, um, and it is only moderately, moderately less uh, bad idea now that uh, the, the provincial government has capped rental increases. It was a very bad idea when it was wide open because it, it just left it open for landlords to increase the rent by $400, it essentially was what the problem is. There is a cap there now, so it's, but um, I think what we need to do is, uh, and in this case, the supply of rental housing is an important one, and I'll just tie it back to something that we've said a couple of times now in this around housing, and that and that is largely around non-market housing solutions, building rental units and a variety of different uh, a, a variety of different from single family to multifamily, um, and and it needs to be more. and And I think that what's really important is. You know, we saw a, uh, a listing for houses that were or homes that were built uh, by these programs and they were like 600 or 700 square feet. And, you know, part of the challenge with this with affordable housing is also it's uh, they're very, very small. And so very few houses for families to rent 
And so this is where the provincial government can step in with the money that they've put on the table for support for housing and for, for homes uh, is making sure that there are um, available places uh, for people to rent uh, in, that, in those investments that they're making. Thanks, Adam. Um, we do have one more question, but if you're both okay with it, I'm going to read it out loud. Sure. Sure. Because uh, I'm not sure we can get it into the slide here. Um, so this is from um, someone through the chat. Maybe we can get the slide taken down the staff. Thanks. And it's kind of a nice segue to end this in terms of what we're we're all about here. The person writes, I wish I could care about housing, environment, indigenous issues, LGBTQ, but I can't because our democracy is in peril and our citizens are suffering. Please help us to assure that you are doing something to hold the NDP accountable. So I think they're looking to see what it is that we can be doing to hold the NDP to account. Yeah. I I, I'm really glad that that this question got asked, and I I, I just want to sort of contextualize this. And I've thought about this a lot. I got into politics because I lost trust in the government. Um, a permit was issued for a landfill in Shawnigan Lake to put five million tons of contaminated soil at the headwaters of our drinking watershed, and it. it, it I remember in 2013, and I, I've just been reflecting on this, I, you know, it's been nine years uh, this Easter since that draft permit was released. And I, I couldn't believe it at the time that any government would even consider uh, such a proposal. Like, of course, governments don't do that. You don't put the health of people in peril. And uh, you know, the, the story of, of all the work that, that happened here in Shawnigan and, and hundreds of people and, and millions of dollars uh, to, to go up against that permit. And it was just, I think just two days ago was the, the anniversary of that permit being revoked in 2017. It took us four years. I, my inclination at every step was, how do I make this better? I, I don't want to tear this down. We, we you know, I, I don't want to tear government down because what, what, what do we leave that with? I want to make it better. And I, I knew that I wanted to be a provincial politician because professional reliance was what the system that underpinned the decision-making that got us to a permit being issued the way it did and the conflict of interests and, and the, the kind of shocking uh, reality that the, the, the owners of the, of the landfill site and the engineers who were supposed to have designed and oversee this could have a secret profit sharing deal and that was okay. And that was a real erosion of trust uh, for me. And I, I uh, grew up in a household where democracy was something we talked about all the time. My dad was born in East Germany. Um, in 1939, October of 1939, I talked about that this morning, um, and emigrated here to Sydney, BC, when he was a teenager, finished high school in, in Sydney, went to University of Victoria, uh, ended up at U of A, got his master's in, and uh, PhD in psychology, and ended up becoming a professor of psychology, and instilled in, in, my, in us, his three kids, and my brother and I will have like hours of conversations about this many weekends, uh, more and more now, instilled in us this fierce protection, protectiveness of democracy, because he lived in not democracy. And when I was 10, uh, he took me to East Germany. And I went into a country that was autocratic, that was behind the Iron Curtain. It was 1980. And uh, my, my memories of that are so vivid uh, although they're all in black and white. And so I have uh, like this cellular level concern and care for democracy. And it is messy and imperfect and disappointing. And at times, you know, leaves us, Adam and me and our team feeling just so upset. And yet, 
the two of us, even today, debating a motion that never gets debated in the House, calling on our colleagues to say, we have to do better. We have to show that this institution is worth protecting and that it's trustworthy and that it matters. And from, from day one um, uh, uh, in the pandemic, I have said, I've stood up in the house and said, you have one job to do over the course of, the, of, of what's going to come. And that is to maintain trust. And you do that by being transparent and being open and tell us what your decisions are based on. Show us how you're measuring them. Show us your success. Make us, take us along in the journey. Give us the ability to have the oversight and accountability that's needed. We're at a point where we have to fiercely fight for this. Um, it's and and I would say this too. We have an unregulated uh, realm that a lot of us have spent a lot more time in in the last two years, and that's social media. And we know that there are algorithms algorithms in there that that feed on uh, riling us up, on putting us into our our corners, on on getting us you know more and more divisive because that's what keeps us on there. That's what that you know that's the 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 AI algorithm. Its goal is to keep us engaged, and it does that by firing us up more and more. And then you have a pandemic and it keeps us all apart. And so these are, uh, this is a, a combination of so many factors um, that are putting, putting things in a, in a perilous place. How do we hope we will not stop Adam and me? And, and one of the things this week, cause this was, this has been a hard week, uh, you know, for us. Um, the number of random times this week that people said to either Adam or me, and, and just that this variety of people who said, you two being in this legislature makes a difference. It matters. And as I said at the outset, we have to stop dehumanizing people in other parties. We have to look at policies. We have to talk about how to improve what are the solutions? We have to insist on working collaboratively because that is a reflection of the society that we need to be. When our political leadership is so corrosive and adversarial and unwilling to work uh, across party lines, it sends a message. We, we, we have to show that it's possible to, to work to build consensus and to work in a way that puts service to people, not to parties first. Uh, and, and it's possible. And I, I will say that there are wonderful, hardworking, service-oriented people in all three parties in the BC legislature, in all parties in Canada. And we have to encourage everybody to rise to the very best they can be in these systems. Sorry, you really, that was a, <laughs> as you can see, this really matters to me. If I may, um, because I, I, I um, agree, this really matters to me as well. And I, I have some, thank you for that, Sonia. And I just would like to say that I think what's important is to recognize that over the last year or so, I've been the green representative on the CBC political panel. And as decisions around COVID have been made, uh, one of the, the most consistent message that I've been delivering on that political panel is that if the BC government does not explain why it's making the decisions that it's making, it will get us to exactly the situation that we're in right now. And I'm, I'm reading your comment. I see the comments here. And I want to be very clear about this. The loss of trust has been a product of a government that is arrogant in believing that it can, because it's a majority, it can do what it wants, and it doesn't have to be accountable for the decisions that it's being made or explain them. And as we are in the situation that we're in now, uh, we have uh, a, a, a government that is not clearly explaining or defending the decisions that it's made. Like Sonia and I have been exceptionally clear 
that we believe in public health measures to deal with public health issues. Uh, and that is a, the, the correct response. However, where we're at today is a crisis in our, we, we talked about the intersecting crisis in our province. We are in a crisis of our democracy that was the seeds were planted over the years where the political parties in our system have used the, the, the political institution that Sonia and I have been elected to essentially as their own, uh, as their own tool for gaining and maintaining power. And that's essentially what it's come down to. I did a video today. I posted it on my Instagram feed. If you're on Instagram, I invite you to go check it out. Because what I talk about is how the opposition has largely been just disagreeing with whatever government puts on the table. And that is not our role. And when we reduce the opposition to the role of disagreeing with everything government does because of partisan interests, we undermine and erode the confidence that I can see some have uh, who have joined us this evening. The role of opposition is to use the accountability tools that our predecessors fought for over hundreds of years to hold government accountable, to not just give unanimous consent because that's what the leader, the house leader of the government wants. And when we don't, then he can have a, a, a fit you know, on camera in front of everybody because he didn't get exactly what he wanted to get at that moment. That's not our role. Our role is to, to do what I did today, which was to stand up in my two minute statement and say, when we see the government abusing the power of the house, we must stand up and say something about it. And that's the role of the opposition is to hold government accountable. And it's an uncomfortable role for government to have an effective opposition and unfortunately, what's happened in this province is opposition has been reduced to saying this when the government said, as I said in my video, when government says that, we say, no, this. When the government says black, we say white. That's not the role of the opposition. And unfortunately, we are going to have uh, some time uh, to get the role of the opposition back to where it is, which is effectively using the tools at our disposal to hold government accountable and to not accept when they simply... Uh, repeat an answer back that was unacceptable in the previous and then to just accept it because they mm -hmm. repeated it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think that while Sonia and I have been very supportive of the public health measures uh, to deal with a global pandemic, we have also been very critical of this government uh, not explaining clearly why it is they're doing what they're doing. And, and uh, the, the result of that has been uh, a considerable degradation of trust in, and confidence in government that we can ill afford mm -hmm. in our democracy, that we can ill afford. And I'll just end with this, to the point that Sonia made, you know, we're seeing around the world right now, there were comments earlier on to acknowledge Ukraine and, and the impacts that are happening uh, in, in Europe right now. The reality is, it's, it the, is stark for us. We must depend, we must defend our democracy, we must defend the institution. And that includes also uh, much better education on how that institution is supposed to work. Because I've seen an awful lot of an Americanization of the comments about our institution that are not applicable <laughs> in our institution. And so I think that civics uh, classes uh, are also important because our system is very different from the system in the United States. And uh, people need to know what those tools of accountability are so that then they as citizens can also be effectively holding uh, us as members of the opposition, but as well the government accountable. Um, thank you to you both. Um, there's no way that we would ever want to cut off short anything you said there, because I think that that is the kind of thing that needs to be said right now. And um, your message is really important. At, at, all times but especially right now so we have a little bit of uh, uh, some things to say in closing um, and we're hoping that our guests can stay on a little longer to allow that to happen uh, we do acknowledge that if you do need to leave it is 8 30 but we do have a couple of things to let you know about that are pretty exciting so if you've liked what you've not heard what you've heard tonight um, and wondering how you can get involved, I'm going to ask Adam to start by talking about how you can get involved in spreading the word. 
Well, hold on a second. I got so talkative that I don't have my script in front of me. <laughs> um, okay, so there, there are three. There are three ways. Uh, the first one is tomorrow. A page uh, about uh, Sonia uh, is going to be published uh, on our website. Uh, we were going to be launching it this evening, but it will be tomorrow morning. Please visit that uh, page on our website. You'll see our website is evolving and changing. Uh, um, I would say daily, but probably not daily, uh, regularly, let's say. Uh, and we will be having a page to uh, in better introduce uh, Sonia to the rest of the province. And so we invite you to uh, uh, to share that page uh, tomorrow. Visit our website, greens. Uh, what is it? bcgreens.ca is what it is. Um, the, uh, okay, was that? Yeah, that's great, Adam. That's Okay, that's all right, that was my job. Okay. That was your job. There are two other ways that I'm going to throw it over to the next person to talk about the second. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Um, I'm now going to invite uh, Kylie Williams, our supporter care specialist, to talk to you about another way that you can support our party by giving a gift and becoming a member. So, Kylie. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Kylie, and I'm the BC Green Supporter Care Specialist. I just want to start by saying thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I know how much hard work went into putting this all together. So thank you to our wonderful speakers and everyone who was involved in organizing the event. I love being able to see the names of so many BC Green community members in the chat. I'm so glad you were able to make it. And I hope that after finally getting into Mentimeter, you enjoyed participating in the issues discussions and the Q&A session just as much as we have. I also want to take a moment to recognize all of our amazing donors who are here tonight. Your commitment to your community is so inspiring and it is the foundation of everything we get to do and accomplish together. Gathering to have these important conversations and hosting these, these kinds of online events wouldn't be possible without your financial support. So thank you for being here to fund our work. Looking ahead to the spring session in the legislature, Sonia and Adam need our help getting the government back. If you're interested in making a donation or becoming a member, you can visit bcgreens.ca slash donate, or better yet, you can also email me at gifts at bcgreens.ca. I'd love to connect with you and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kylie. Um, it's also great that you get to see some of our staff tonight in addition to our wonderful MLAs. I'm now pleased to uh, in, introduce you to Sabine Muller and she is our field organizer and she's going to talk to you about getting involved in, drum roll, the Quilchena Vancouver by-election that we are expecting to happen in the coming months. Sabine. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Yonina. Um, I just want to give you all a short update on what is happening with the Vancouver Kelchena by-election. As some of you may know, Andrew Wilkinson has stepped down. He was the former leader of the BC Liberals to make way for Kevin Falcon, uh, the new BC Liberal leader. While the specifics of the by-election have not been announced, so we don't know when election day is going to be quite yet, uh, we are excited to have this opportunity to start connecting with voters in Vancouver, Kilchenna. So right now we're in the process of nominating our candidate. Uh, we're working with our riding associations in Vancouver to get everything organized and uh, put a really good uh foot forward in this by-election. Um, as well, we're going to have a lot of exciting opportunities to volunteer and support our upcoming candidate. So you can sign up to volunteer or you can donate at the links on your screen as well as in the chat. Uh, so you can support our, uh, our election this time around. We're really excited for this opportunity. It's going to be a great opportunity to share uh, our policies and share why we need more BC Greens in the legislature. So thank you all so much uh, for coming out tonight, and I hope you'll get involved coming soon. Thanks so much, Sabine. So uh, before Sonia uh, says a few closing remarks, I just want to thank you again for coming tonight, um, for your encouragement and all that you do to support us as we work together to make BC a better place. I hope you got to know a little bit more uh, about us and meet some of our staff. And uh, Sonia, I'll turn it over to you to wrap up the evening. Thanks, Johanna, and uh, thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. Uh, I really appreciate you taking your time and, and engaging, and I know not everybody's question got answered. We will endeavor to do more of these, and hopefully uh, soon, um, 
one day that uh, we can do these in person again. And I know that that's also something that uh, it, we're all feeling the need for. Uh, to the staff, Yonina, Stefan, Kylie, Maddie, uh, Cam, you've really put a lot of work into this. And, and again, I just wanna say how much I appreciate uh, all that you've done. Um, and to all of you, Adam and I are, uh, you know, humbled uh, and honored to be in service and uh, really uh, appreciate uh, the input and the, the questions and everything that you raise. Um, we are ourselves always striving to learn and to do better. And uh, this uh, interactions always help. Um, and we will continue to do everything we can uh, to hold this government to account uh, on behalf of the people of British Columbia and all of you tonight. Thank you.